people. Today on the line, uh, social distancing from me all the way in Seattle is Matthias Roberts. Um, he is the author of the book Beyond Shame. Hi, mm. Matthias. Hi. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so happy. And Matthias is uh, doing something kind for me and that he's not expecting his book have, having been read from cover to cover. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a book deadline of my own. Otherwise, I would have totally done it because even just reading the introduction in the first few chapters, I was mm. engrossed and so mm. into it. Mm. Um, so the topic of your book is just really primarily about that one subject, which is mm. shame, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, primarily sexual shame uh, and, and kind of that question of for, for those of us who who grew up, I mean, most specifically kind of within evangelical-based purity culture, um, but, but arguably, I mean, whether you grew up within that specific context or not, a lot of us grew up with sexual shame. So, so the, the book is, how do we work with the shame we've been given around our sexuality? And then how do we move beyond it? How do we, how do we find a place of, of groundedness and healing? Yeah. I think it's so incredible because actually just last week I had Dr. Tina Sellers on for an interview. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's incredible. And she actually wrote the foreword to your book. Mm -hmm. So I didn't plan this intentionally, but it's very interesting how, you know, everyone is coming at this from different angles and it's all mm -hmm. so necessary. Like I love, um, you know, how every author I've been experiencing is just like tackling the beast from their own perspective, but in a way that like resonates. And if you put all the books together, it's like you have this really big picture. Yeah. And with Dr. Tina, you have a vision of exactly how we are rooted in this um, doctrine that we were taught about mm -hmm. our sexuality and to um, abstain and avoid and make ourselves as sexless as possible until we're in the quote right context to have a sexual experience um, which is a very limiting perspective in evangelicalism it's just man wife mm -hmm. with a marriage certificate and that's it right, right, right. Um, you know and even in that you're like well what uh, sex acts are acceptable and not acceptable and even that comes into question for a lot of people in religion so I think it's beautiful that Tina wrote the forward to your book because mm. then it's like okay great we have all the history we have the knowledge but here I am in shambles experiencing vaginismus or erectile dysfunction and how mm -hmm. am I supposed to pull myself out of this right so I'm hoping that you're going to tell me your book just tackles all of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah to to a point I mean I, I think there's there's a level of of um like we get into, I think we get into a bind sometimes in these conversations because it is just like you're saying, it is such a broad topic with such far reaching effects and, and it affects each of us so personally and in different ways. So I, I really, in a way, kind of tried to, to take a step back and, and look at like, what are some kind of things that we can somewhat universally say, like I, I shy away from universal prescriptions, but some things that we can kind of say like, these are things we can observe, at least, uh, that ways that we're affected by purity culture, but also things that we know that are kind of inherent within sex and sexuality. Um, the, the end of the book, the kind of reconstruction part, um, I really focus in on, on this idea of paradoxes. Uh, there are paradoxes inherent within sexuality that, that I believe once we begin to kind of navigate and, and work within, it kind of starts giving us that path forward, that mm. path of healing uh, that we can walk down as we really engage this conversation of, of what sex is as opposed to what it's not or what it shouldn't be, if that makes sense. No, totally. What um, inspired you to write this book in the first place? Would you share a little bit of your story for the God's yeah, Great community? I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in a super religious, super conservative uh, family. My, my parents, uh, Christian, uh, borderline fundamentalist is kind of the way I put it. Usually they they weren't quite fundamentalists, but they were, they were pretty close. <laughs> Teetering on um, the edge. <laughs> right there. <laughs> I was homeschooled. I uh, went to, went to grow up in rural Iowa, a uh, really small community. And 
uh, seeped in purity culture. I mean, that, that was kind of the, the, the air that I breathed. I, I share a story at the beginning of the book of, of kind of my, my even first sexual memory, sexual memory, because I was, I was young, was my mom saying, don't look at that when things would come on the TV mm-hmm. or women would appear on billboards, uh, like cover your eyes. Uh, was a message that was in, ingrained from from a very young age for me, and and so uh, that paired with uh, realizing when I was about eleven or twelve that I was attracted to men, um, and I started kind of feeling the feelings that I put together this sense of oh, this is what my mom doesn't want me to look at because, because of these feelings. But mm. then on the heels of that, realize like, oh, but these aren't the right kinds of feelings. So there was shame about feeling the feelings and there was shame about, oh, these aren't the right kind of feelings because I, wow. I feel it for men. Yeah. Yeah. Let's break that down really quick because I, <laughs> I loved reading that one thing you said was essentially that boys in evangelicalism are taught to cover their eyes and girls mm-hmm. are taught to cover their bodies. Yes. And yes. Um, I keep saying again and again that gendering desire and gendering who is visually stimulating or stimulated doesn't you know, it's not accurate by any means. We're Mm -hmm. both capable of having sexual feelings. We're both capable of being visually stimulated. So that, you know, decision to present us this very gendered narrative of what we're going to feel and think and sense is also interesting and something that really has to be unpacked because Mm -hmm. in adulthood, it leads you to, as a woman, um, feeling so heartbroken if your partner turns you down sexually because we Mm. were told guys just salivate for sex and they'll never say no and then on the reverse you know if you're a guy that's not that visually stimulated and you want more connection and depth in your sexuality then you feel like a freak or you're too feminine right so what I mean, it's really interesting that you're coming from the script of gender, but they imposed the shame on the wrong sex, mm-hmm. not realizing at the time your orientation would be different. Right, right. How, how does it feel to look back on that and realize, you know, what you had to process in that moment? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I put together, actually, while I was writing this book was, was how close, so that, that don't look narrative how close that was to kind of our classic symptoms of shame. Uh, Something that I argue in the book is is shame makes us look away. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the research that shows up a lot is a lot of times when we feel shame, we almost involuntarily will look towards the exit or look down or try to distance ourselves from the source of the shame. And and when I started putting that together, it 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 started making a lot of sense to me that, um, shame felt so deeply tied up in my sexuality um, because that's what I was taught. Like, do not look. And eventually it became harder not to look. Like once I hit the underwear aisles of, of Walmart, like in the, in the like, men's section, in the men's section, <laughs> like all of a sudden it got a lot harder not to look like it was no problem looking at the billboards that my mom didn't want me to look at. Like, right. It wasn't an issue. <laughs> <laughs> Those underwear aisles will get you. Um, mm. And and I, I wrestled with it. I mean, I, I thought, because it was, it was around that time too that I started uh, kind of looking into like, or, or at least hearing what the quote unquote Bible taught about, about same sex attraction and um, hearing, you know, it's an abomination and you're going to go to hell. And, you know, I was, I was 12 years old hearing all these things thinking like, oh my gosh, like I'm feeling these feelings. They're going to stone me. Like that's yeah. literally what I went to. It's like, I'm going to yeah. get stoned <laughs> mm-hmm. and then I'm going to go to hell. Um, and it, it was terrible. Were you mad at God for that? Or did you feel like something was wrong with you? I thought something was wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think that, I don't think I had the, um, I don't know if it would be ego strength, but to even question God, like that idea of questioning God wasn't really part of, part of the way I, I viewed the world. It was, it was me. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, so definitely. Was, yeah. Definitely. That can feel very scary. No, I've experienced the same thing a million times mm-hmm. where your, your idea of God is so convoluted with what you've been told versus what you innately feel that you can't right. really sift through the mess and figure out 
that God actually loves you. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I really wanted, I I had such a desire to keep reading because Mm. I was very intrigued by the idea that you were trained to have this physical response to something, which would be a Victoria's Secret, you know, commercial comes on the TV and you were trained to physically respond Mm -hmm. by turning away, even though you didn't innately feel that shame and that need to turn away. Right. Um, But it was reminding me of some Ted talk I'd seen at some point about body language and Mm -hmm. how, you know, if you're feeling really insecure and you put your hands up in the air and like breathe that it can convince your, like your mind will catch up and you're suddenly be like, Oh wait, I am confident because you're not Mm -hmm. shying down. So did you research more about the connection between, you know, your body functioning in this way and then leading to an actual fear response in you emotionally? Yeah. I I mean, not that specifically, Mm -hmm. um, but what I what I did look into, and um, I, I don't I don't know that I've I've mentioned this yet, but I, I'm a therapist, so I mean this is this is work that is so deeply tied into just the work I do do with people, and and something that that we do know is that um, emotions and and feelings begin in the body, and we feel them in our bodies before they even reach our heads. So by the time that we're able to acknowledge an emotion, it has already existed in our body, and, mm-hmm. and so that's why like this kind of idea that we can quote unquote, take control of our emotions with our brains. In, in some ways that's true. In other ways, it's not because right. emotion originates in the body. Mm-hmm. Thought originates in the body. And so it makes sense then as we work with our body is that that's going to influence what we think, the way we respond to things. Um, and so if, if, we're, if we're mimicking a shame response with our physical bodies, um, that's going to affect our, our thought life, our, our thought life. <laughs> I don't know why I use that term, but that's going to affect the, the way we think, the way, the way that we act in the world and, and feel in the world. Um, so yeah. yes. Yeah. So after you realized that you were attracted to the quote, wrong sex, mm-hmm. what sort of journey did that lead you on? Yeah. I Deep mean, sigh. it was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> Deep sigh. <laughs> It was it was quite the journey uh, mm-hmm. to kind of move out of the, this fundamentalist world and, and into uh, an acceptance of myself and, and then um, the acceptance from God that ultimately is what, what I arrived at. That, that, um, it's not just something that I can give myself, it's something that God gives me. Um, and that took, I mean, I, I realized I was gay I didn't use that language for it but I realized I was gay when I was 11 and it wasn't until I was 23 24 that I really was able to uh, metabolize that and and integrate it into uh, a life Um, wow and 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 that that's really kind of what what led me to this book was after <laughs> I had kind of accepted myself and, and done the theological work uh, to realize like, no, God doesn't actually have a problem with this. Well, people have told me they were very wrong. Um, then all the other questions came of like, well, what does that mean about sex? Like, what does that mean about all these other things that I was taught? What does this mean about God? What does this mean about the way that we exist in the world as humans? And it was those questions that, that really led me into um focusing on shame, but especially sexual shame, uh, because it it permeates so much of our lives. Absolutely. It's so important. Well, before we continue, I did want to clarify for anyone that's unfamiliar with fundamentalism, Mm -hmm. how lucky you are, first of all. (laughs) and Second of all, um, the term same sex attracted is often adopted by LGBTQ people instead of the term gay or lesbian, um, because that is perceived to be taking on the identity and instead of actually recognizing it for what it is, which is a sin. Or is that the way you would describe it as well? 100%. Yeah. I thought that if I were to ever use the word gay to describe myself, that quite literally the work of Satan would be complete in my life. Wow. Wow. Um, And so, I mean, I remember even the first time that those words came out of my mouth, like I'm gay. I was terrified. I didn't, I mean, I didn't think anything was going to happen, but also I had all these fantasies of like thunder and lightning and like Satan appearing and like all these things, like, because that's what I was taught. I identify as gay. 
um, it's identifying with sin. Right. Um, and I know it can be so confusing because, you know, it's not just the the subject that's difficult of like, oh, acknowledging I'm an abomination. It's something that you feel like you have to honor because you do love God in this, mm-hmm. in this part of yourself. Right. Were you feeling like you weren't allowed to speak with God on the subject or like, what were you doing in these interim of years of at 11 realizing you were gay and then 23, you know, is that the time where you finally looked heavenward and said, what do you think about this God or mm-hmm. what would that look like? No, it was, I mean, it was pretty constant conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you know, early years, a lot of it was just conversation of like, change me. Like, um, I know, yeah. I know you're all powerful, or I believe you're all powerful. I believe all these things, like, take this away from me. I want to be normal. Mm. Uh, and it really wasn't until uh, in 19, I found a therapist who I, I actually went in for conversion therapy. Like, I asked for conversion therapy. I said, I want to change my same sex desires. And like, I mean, I, I truly see this as, as God's grace in my life. Like this therapist was like, yeah, n- no, like, <laughs> that wow. doesn't happen. Um, and, and he, he was a Christian counselor. And so he was not affirming. He, he didn't believe that, uh, um, gay relationships were okay, but he also didn't buy into this idea that you can change your sexual orientation. And so in our first session, he said to me, like sexual orientation doesn't change, uh, so what we're going to work on is is how do we live as faithful Christ followers with this in tow? And wow. that was the first time I ever heard anything like that. Like this idea that my sexual orientation might not change. It just felt like this huge weight was removed from me because I knew, like in my body, knew like this, this isn't going to change. Like I'd been trying for years. Um and so that was really kind of the beginning of freedom was, wow. was learning that and then starting you know, doing theological exploration and, and through therapy and, and, and um, you know, years of work. Um, what, okay. So the thing that comes to my mind is Bethel church in Reading mm-hmm, has yeah. an operation that they call changed. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be respectful because I did interview one of the founders of changed mm-hmm. um, who identifies as same sex attracted. And, you know, part of me wants to like honor her journey and what she told me, et cetera. But I f- still find it very impossible to just not call it what it is, which is a version of conversion therapy, yeah. where maybe if you're not one-on-one with a counselor, you are in a group setting, kind of like AA, trying right. to abstain from this mm-hmm. sexual activity or abstain from like allowing yourself to be gay. Right. Um, what do you think it does to the psyche of a person to tell them that their sexuality can change? Yeah. It, it does a variety of things. <laughs> Another deep sigh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I approach this from kind of a, a mix between, between a psychological and a theological view. Um, I kind of start with two core assumptions, uh, one of which has been rooted in Christian orthodoxy since kind of the very beginning of Christianity is this idea that our sexuality is a very core part of who we are as people. Um, It is uh, something that that exists at some of the core places of of our beings. And, And so when we start working with this messaging that your sexuality is at the root fundamentally disordered, it's impossible to separate that from hearing, I am fundamentally disordered. Right. Um, we can do a lot of gymnastics with that. And I did a lot of gymnastics with that for a long time saying like, well, um, I'm not fundamentally disordered, but because my sexuality is is oriented this direction, um, therefore, it, like, it's part of original sin or blah, 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 yeah. blah, whatever. Um, and forgive the interruption, but this just reminds me of we we don't hate the sinner. We hate the sin. Right. And what you're saying is, like, that's what I keep trying to explain to people, how cruel that statement is. Because mm-hmm. it's like, that's not the message. That's like saying, I don't hate, you know, 
blonde people. I hate their blonde hair. And you're like, but <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> and that is less fundamental to me than my sexuality. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Cause you can change your hair color. Right. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and I, so th- that's, I mean, that's a huge thing that happens. So then you start telling someone like you can only be a part of our community. You can only be loved by God. You can only be loved by your parents, by your church. If you pretend to be something you're not. Uh, If you try to disidentify with a core part of who you are, um, you must be something different than who you are. So that creates a a, a process of splitting. Um, And that starts a process of where you have your kind of internal life, your internal struggles, and then the parts of you that that present um, differently to the world and um and i believe like i think people are very genuine in this like i i think you know i understand why people choose to be celibate i understand like i I don't understand the change movement i'm gonna be fully honest in that (laughs) Um, but (laughs) but i did come from that and and um long story short i mean it wreaks havoc on lives and and there's a path towards freedom um, and towards actual freedom that, uh, that brings us into, into the, I mean, what, what, when Jesus says, I came so that you can have life and have life abundantly. Mm-hmm. Um, there's abundant life and abundant life doesn't look like uh, pretending to be something you're not. Um, I really wish that <laughs> I had had the time to read the book, but mm-hmm. I, because now my question becomes, how tied in into all of this is shame because when you talk about this compartmentalization of my sexuality is over here and the rest of my life and Mm -hmm. like the rest of my life my family my friends my interaction with my church my prayer life is all in this other corner when you have to do that and compartmentalize then all of a sudden that part of you is out to sea. And it just reminds me of the beginning of your book when you're talking about Mm -hmm. looking away and distancing yourself from the thing that's causing you shame. Right. So would you say that's how it is when you start taking on that shame? Yeah. So I I mean, there's some some corollaries there of of what purity culture taught us. Um, In some ways, purity culture taught all of us that we have to compartmentalize our sexuality and that Mm -hmm. we have to control it in some way. So, so that, that, I mean, with that assumption that sexuality is a core part of who we are as people, we are sexual beings created that way by God. Um, shame also affects us at a core part of who we are. Uh, shame is the messaging that I am bad. I am wrong. I am distorted. Uh, a lot of people will contrast that with guilt uh, which is, I did something bad. I did something wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, shame is, is way, way, way deeper than that. This is my core identity. So sexual shame, you have the double whammy of core part of our identity and shame attacking core part of our identity. And it just turns into this shit storm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so our work then is to is to start to identify in what ways have I been shaped by sexual shame. Um, I, I talk about coping mechanisms at the beginning of the of the book, the first few chapters of of kind of primary ways that a lot of folks respond to sexual shame. Identifying how we actually respond to our shame, because if we don't know what it actually looks like, the shape our shame takes, um, then we can't work with it. We can't heal from it. Um, we have to identify that that first. What are some of the, like, could you give us some examples that you would recognize in your life or in people that you've seen in your practice? Yeah. So, so there are three main coping mechanisms that, that I've kind of found through, through my work. Um, they're, they're fluid. We move kind of between them. Uh, but uh, the, the first one I call shame fullness. Uh, and it's this idea that we're, we're using our shame to control our sexuality. So a lot of that kind of the clamping down, the uh, putting it in a box that I am not going to experience sexual feelings. 
because of my shame. Purity culture use shame as a tool to control sexuality, right? Even the way you just define that as like vaginismus, that's right. exactly what it sounds like. 100%. Closing yourself up, not allowing it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that's that shamefulness. Mm-hmm. Uh, another way that, that a lot of folks use to manage their shame is shamelessness. So it's the flip side. It's when we use our sexuality to control our shame. Uh, so a, a lot of times I, I see this a lot and I experience this in my life is when we're breaking free from purity culture, we, we kind of say, I don't know if I can swear, but we kind of say, <laughs> fuck it all. Um, <laughs> And I'm just going to do what I want. See, that's what I call my tramp page. That's what yeah, I do. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And so we're, we're using, I mean, in some ways we're trying on a new identity, but we're also using our sexuality to control our shame mm. and just push the shame down. Wow. But it's not actually dealing with the shame, right? The shame is still there. Um, and it's actually kind of motivating this, the shameless I feel so called out. I never thought of it that way before. <laughs> wow. So that's another really big one. And and the interesting thing about that one is like, we may actually be doing things that feel like they align with our values. Like we're maybe trying on new values um, and there may not actually be anything wrong with what we're doing, but we just haven't dealt with the shame underneath. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the third one is, is what I call autopilot. Uh, and that's kind of for, for some of us who maybe didn't grow up in as strict as environments or as purity in purity culture, or we've done some work with our sexual shame, uh, but it still kind of lingers. It's that sense of maybe we have sex with someone and the shame pops up and, and we're like, oh, I meant to work with that, but um, <laughs> take another I, I shot. Haven't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done it yet, or I'll deal right. with that later. Mm-hmm. So we have a sense of what our values are, but we haven't actually done the hard work of, of kind of really working with our shame. Uh, those are the kind of three coping mechanisms. Uh, and I see them manifest all over the place. <laughs> like yeah. they're pretty common. No, I love that because that makes it very concise. And I, I feel like you would be able to identify which one you're working with. And I would yeah. argue I I would work with all three on right. my journey of deconstruction. 100%. And before deconstruction, of course. Right, right. Because um, I was actually reminiscing about my married life because mm. I, had, I had tried to save myself from marriage, but I failed and quote unquote. And my failures were, you know, making out with a guy at a party. And then I Mm. felt like, oh, I just already ruined so much. Everything was just this ruination more and more and more every step that I took. And um, by the time I was getting divorced, even before then, I would have sex and marriage and I would find new things to feel Mm. terrible about. Like, oh, I shouldn't have done it in this way or I shouldn't have drank so much before, like whatever, it would Mm -hmm. still was like infiltrating every single moment. And I really couldn't, my breaking point was realizing my trampage reaction that I now talking to you realize is all three of those Mm -hmm. elements or components to it led me to like the most abusive relationship of my life where I was Mm -hmm. really feeling my body had been fully disrespected by me by other people. And, um, and instead of that complacency that I was feeling for so long, it turned into this resolve because I had recognized this compartmentalization that my sexuality was one corner. My, my, my spirituality was in the other corner. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was really Linda K. Klein's book, Pure. Yes, 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 yes. That really helped me not only find community and the fact that I was very much so not alone, even though I thought I was alone. Mm-hmm. Like when I started God is Gray, I was like in a field by myself. Like, hey, is anyone else out here <laughs> feeling this? Right. And when I read that book, I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. And I really devoted myself to realigning myself with my creator with what I wanted to do and how I wanted to move through the world and Mm -hmm. I truly believe that's what invited such great love and peace into my life um Mm -hmm. so if someone is on this journey and I found it excruciating it sounds Mm -hmm. like you did too Mm -hmm. what are the, the first steps I would think the first is to recognize which of these components you're working with the shame what do you do next you don't have to do a 10 year journey like I right, did. Right, right, same, right. <laughs> Let's fast track the Let's God is Great community. On the fast track, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I mean, there's a variety of things you can do, kind of the next step. So you recognize the shame. I, I do think that that's a huge first step. Um, the next step that I take in, in my book and, and, and then kind of work with a lot of clients on 
is then starting to impact the lies that we were told about sex and sexuality. Mm. Uh, so I, I have chapters on like what the Bible actually teaches about sex. Like it's a whole lot more ambiguous than I was taught to believe. The words in scripture don't actually mean the things that I was taught they meant. Do you, you mean like sexual immorality mm-hmm. as a blanket yeah. term? I know and I find that fornication. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Could you give a, a little blip about yeah. what you discovered in that? I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sexual immorality, fornication, uh, most of those words in, in our current translations of scripture were translated from the Greek porneia. Uh, and porneia is one of those terms. There's, there's a lot of disagreement within uh, scholarly communities about what that word meant because it was a pretty uncommon word at the time. Uh, and so it, it was interesting as I was doing a lot of research around it, I found that this, the scholars who were making these arguments were really making arguments um, aligned with kind of their their political agendas or their uh, kind of where they sat on on that spectrum of, of um, what they believed about sex and sexuality uh and so what that said to me was there's a lot of ambiguity in this term and it's almost as if like paul people who wrote scripture used a term that was ambiguous so that we would actually have to think about it (laughs) Uh, because there's this sense of like they're taking sex seriously right like I read scripture and I see the sense of like, this is something to be taken seriously, but it's not a one size fit all thing. And, and so this, this, this term pornea, I mean, it's translated. There's, there's at least six different use cases for it within the new Testament. Wow. Uh, it can mean a variety of different things, um, which means that we actually have to start doing some work ourselves to figure out what we believe. Um, I love that because that's something that Pete Enns says. Uh, he's a biblical scholar and he calls the Bible ambiguous. Yep. And this black and white, you know, fundamentalism is really rooted in the black and white. You know, I have tender hearted 16 year old teenagers write me on Instagram and yell at me about how sexual immorality in the Bible is clear. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, just oh sweetheart come on mm-hmm. like we need to look deeper and i think that is beautiful because pete talks about how the bible is such a beautiful invitation yeah. to self discovery and to the discovery of the divine which we will never fully understand right. um until we're elsewhere so mm-hmm. i i love that i've never heard before that that pornea was such an ambiguous term and something that would invite us to play with it and toy with it and see what it means to us yeah um. I, I, the, for me, this really comes to the question of like, what is the nature of truth? And I mean, we have this story within scripture of Jesus being asked, what is truth by Pilate? And Jesus stays silent when he's asked that question. But previously throughout Jesus's life, he, he said in different places, I've come to bear witness to the truth. And the way I read that is Jesus is saying something about the nature of truth is that it's something to be witnessed. Witness implies experience. Witness mm-hmm. implies something that can be noticed throughout time. Um, and, and so when it comes to, to purity culture, or sexual immorality, or, or any of these things, truth is something that can be witnessed, and untruth is something that can be witnessed. And we're given these tools within scripture, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Like those are things that we can witness and then test experiences against. And so when we come to like purity culture and our teachings about sexuality, my big question is what is the witness that we're being given? And for a lot of us, they're, they're not <laughs> kindness, yeah. gentleness, peace, self-control, which means it's not truth. Wow. Mm. Wow. <clears throat> that's a really stunning way to look at it. I completely agree. And that's something that a lot of us experience in our deconstruction, this cognitive dissonance. And I was experiencing that when I was beginning this tramp age. And that's a mm. thing that I say lovingly towards myself and the experience. I love it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was experiencing like 
rolling around in bed with somebody and have it feel very light and airy and breezy and fun and kind. And I felt respected and I left and was like, I'm supposed to feel horrible about like I I was supposed to be crawling on my hands and knees, like Mm -hmm. knowing that God hated me for this. And I couldn't comprehend you know, I just thought I was in a state of rebellion. I was like, I guess I right. can't even hear God because I'm not even receiving his conviction. Mm-hmm. It didn't even occur to me that I was testing experience and that the conviction wasn't coming because maybe, just maybe I wasn't doing anything wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's wild. But mm-hmm. you have so much, um, you know, you're leaned back in your chair with such a great air of confidence mm-hmm. that I commend you for. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. goodness gracious, how does someone who was pounded with so much shame about who they inherently are and were come to a place of leaning back in, in complete peace you know, relaying these scriptures, these interpretations and telling me you are at one with yourself and God. How did you get there? I, I, I realize I'm, I'm laughing a lot, like the, the exasperated laugh. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an exhausting journey. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so happy for you. And I, I hope you. anyone that's mm. seeing your reaction to these things really clocks that and realizes, oh my gosh, if he can do this, I can do this too. And that's, I think that's true. Um, yeah. Very much so. I mean, I think sometimes, like I, I sometimes will tentatively even claim that I'm a therapist because I think sometimes I'm, we, we can put therapists on pedestals and, and think like, oh, because they're therapists, they have it all figured out. Like, yeah. hell, <laughs> hell no. Um, but it's like when a hairdresser is doing in your hair and you're like, well, right. when's the last time you did your hair? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> But it has been a huge journey. It has been, I mean, years and years and years and years of therapy for me Mm. uh, to work through with my own therapist and to even learn these ideas of, um, I mean, a huge practice in my life has been self-compassion. And I think I credit a lot of my, I mean, of my ability to even sit here to the self-compassion work that I've done um, and, and learning to, to give myself the kindness that I would uh, give to a close friend. Um, oh, that's so that is- crucial. I have an interview with um, Nate Postalweight as well. Yeah, yeah. Am, yeah. Mm-hmm. He's wonderful. He has, mm-hmm. you know, similar, everyone's story is unique, but at the same time, there's these through lines that are so similar with many of us. And um, he was closeted and in conversion therapy for 10 years. And um, he talked about practicing and exercising compassion for the younger versions of himself yeah and at first he you know when he was told to talk to eight-year-old self he said you know get in this room you little asshole like he had so much resentment and disdain for his inner child right and working through that was so healing for him Mm -hmm. so i just want to like validate what you're saying and also talk about the value that i've seen in his life and mine as well yeah it's so it's so important it i mean that that feels like the really key work to me, especially for those of us who are recovering from messages that we were given growing up. Um, yeah. Cause it's, it's so easy to hate those parts of ourselves or to, to feel really yucky about those parts of ourselves right. and learning to love those parts of ourselves and, and kind of give those parts of ourselves the, the care that they didn't get. Yeah. When we were growing up. Mm. I mean, this is reminding me too. The person that began your journey to freedom said, you were born this way, this isn't going to change. And that was a portion of freedom. That sounds like half of what you needed. Mm -hmm. How did you come to terms with or leave, leave that person behind? Because they weren't affirming your sexuality. So I imagine at some point you had to break free. Yeah. From, from that therapist. Yeah. I, that, that was kind of a natural progression. I only saw him for uh about two years um and then i I mean i was undergrad i I graduated uh and uh kind of i guess graduated from therapy (laughs) (laughs) and and my work with him though kind of prompted this this big theological journey for me of where i was being told kind of so it it moved from you can change your sexuality to uh, you can't change your sexuality, but you have to stay single and celibate. Like that's yeah. the faithful thing. 
but the places where celibacy is is talked about in scripture, I mean, it's talked about with a level of kind of seriousness, and it's talked about as a calling, yeah. Uh, that and a choice I, and a choice, right? Mm-hmm. That I felt uh, relatively uncomfortable saying, like, I am going to commit myself to celibacy when one, I don't feel called to it. Like, like Paul talks about those who burn with passion <laughs> versus those who are called to celibacy, and I definitely felt like I identified with those who burn with passion <laughs> yeah. a lot more <laughs> than the ones who don't. Um, so th- that and the sense of like, this is a huge commitment for me as a 19 year old to make. I need, I yeah. heard rumors of these people who said like, you can be gay and Christian. Uh, and so I started, I started looking in, into those, which then brought I mean, me also on. your book talks about connectedness Mm -hmm. and disconnection and uh sex is such an opportunity for connection with another human being you know i've interviewed asexual people Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. they've expressed to me the struggle they have to find companionship and connection that's long term because they have no desire to get sexual with a person that said, it's like, no, of course you don't have to have sex with someone to have a, a committed, beautiful relationship, but it right. is more difficult in those situations because sex by nature is a connected experience and it does right. inspire people to stay together even sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, and, and right, everything right. else in between. Mm-hmm. So I, I think people take for granted that when they say, oh, LGBTQ people must stay celibate, that you're actually saying, so you'll never have a family of your right. own. So you'll never have a connected um, heaven touching earth kind of orgasmic experience with a right. person that you love, even mm-hmm. if you're married to them. And just a connection of, you know, holding hands and walking to get coffee after a night of making love. They're telling you you'll never have any of that and that you should just be okay with that. Right. Right. Like I can't imagine how that sounds hitting the body and the soul. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's devastating. Yeah. Uh, I remember the first time that I considered that I could be in a relationship. Mm-hmm. I was, I was I think 20 or 21. So the first time that this idea of like, I could be in a relationship with someone. Wow. It, it was something that I, I wouldn't let myself think about because I thought I was so wrong. Um, But I had just read a book by a guy named Justin Lee uh, called Torn, Rescuing the Gospel from the Gay versus Christians Debate. Yes. And it's an incredible book. And I read that book. I put it down and went to go take a walk and started letting myself imagine what it could feel like to be in a relationship with someone. Mm. And I was on a dirt road in the middle of Oklahoma and the sun was setting and it was this powerful experience of of where I I felt myself tearing up because like all of a sudden all of these feelings that I had never let myself feel before came flooding in and and I I mean I remember it today to this day it was just this profound sense of this is what I was created for in a way I mean not to say that relationships are the end-all be-all but (laughs) But we are we're, created for connection. But we're connection. created for a relationship, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, and I had cut myself off from all of that. I was told I had to cut myself off from all of that in order to be love, in order to be in relationship, which is just a really messed up thing. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness gracious. So that's beautiful. Would you say this moment under the Oklahoma sunshine was when you first began dipping your toe in to healing? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. 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 I think, I mean, there was definitely the whole journey before that to even be able to get to that point. But that was, I mean, that was a pretty significant moment of, of discovering, like, I could feel good things. Mm, That's amazing. So whether we are gay or straight or asexual or whatever, what does your book really have to say about shame and how to overcome it? Yeah. Yeah. So, I I mean, I think these, these, like like I mentioned a little bit earlier, these paradoxes, I think are a huge thing. Um, There are four of them in the book. Sex is healthy and risky. Uh, Sex requires vulnerability and helps us avoid vulnerability. 
um, sex requires safety and safety is not guaranteed. Wow. Uh, and then we will get things wrong and right at the same time. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> See, I knew I was so hard to put your book down, actually. <laughs> I was like, no, I want to keep going. That makes me um, really happy to hear. <laughs> no, definitely. It's very engaging. It's a, it really draws you in. And mm. I love that because I mm. keep explaining, you know, I've been comparing the invitation to have sex with someone that's not in a you know 100% safe space aka you know where the christians put it that right. you just walk down the aisle and you're about to have the safest most mutual blissful experience you've ever had in your life mm -hmm. first of all i think a lot of us have discovered that that is not true fantasy yeah mm -hmm. yeah and that just because you've chosen a certain person to have a party with one day and make this commitment doesn't mean that you're in a safe space sexually. Right. Um, but also that like when we go into a sexual experience, it's like Eve eating the apple, mm -hmm. you will gain knowledge. Mm -hmm. And with knowledge comes pleasure or pain comes, right. you know, it's just like, I think a lot of us in Christianity were taught from this really good place in people's hearts. Like my original youth pastor, I remember him just caring so deeply for us as teenagers and really mm -hmm. loving God himself. So for him, I believe it was about protecting us and keeping us safe so that we wouldn't get broken hearts or STDs or get pregnant. Right. Whereas it would have been so much more profound and, and effective to say, you can have sex these are the risks and not just like show us pictures of genitals covered in warts, right. but like yes. actually being like, you might cry in the shower for a day and a half because mm -hmm. he didn't call you back. Or, right. you know, you might hurt your best friend because she liked him first. Like these things are what we should be considering. I mean, not to an end. You can't worry about everything all the time, but like sex is risky, like you said. And I love mm -hmm. that each chapter has the, dichotomy of the experience because sex like nothing else has more power to heal or to harm than right. anything else I can think of right yeah and I think I mean for so long the conversation has been one or the other yeah and, and we kind of get in our camps of, of what camp we're in oh it's mm -hmm. harmful or oh it's really healthy but I think the true power comes is when we're able to bring those things together because yeah. they're both true I mean they're paradoxes like these things are they're true and I think they're I mean I argue in the book they're inherent within sexuality and so as we begin to navigate these paradoxes we really can then start to find like what are our values and when we can find our values we find a place of groundedness and when we're operating on groundedness we're a whole lot less likely to experience shame yeah and that's what I call sexual integrity mm -hmm. there's no shame there's no fear you are it's like enthusiastic consent, mutuality. Right. But if you can throw some love in there, awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would argue that even if that, well, first of all, love is a very limiting term. You know, the Greeks have like six words for it. We have right. this one. So right, it's like, right. you know, I've had sex with friends that love mm -hmm. me, but there wasn't that like worshipful kind of love making right. occurring that right. you can have. So it's, yeah, such a vast experience. Mm -hmm. And I love that you're saying your book opens people up to consider these as possibilities and then sets them on a course to create their own ethic. Right, right. Because another core thing is I, I think sexual ethics are going to look different for each of us. Yeah. Uh, and and when I set out to write this book, I really, I didn't want to write another book that said, here's a sexual ethic. Here's right healthy sexuality because that's not realistic is it's gonna look different based on each of our particularities yeah but there are things that are true about sexuality that we can work with and navigate and then use that to help us find what our values are and then also realize like that's probably also going to change over our lifetimes like the last one we will get things right and wrong at the same time and we'll learn from that and the stakes aren't as high as I think a lot of us were taught <laughs> with impurity culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. <sighs> well, I don't know. Do you have any final thoughts that you think people should understand or know when they're navigating, whether they're in the shame fully or trying to come out of it? 
what would you mm. maybe say to them? You know, for me, so, so like I said, like that kind of first core message that I was taught growing up was don't look. And what I really want to say to folks is, is no, like, look, turn towards your sexuality. Mm. Because I, I think the only way kind of through our sexual shame is to dive deeper into our bodies, into our sexuality, into what we've been taught, um, into our shame even, um, because then we can work with it and then we can understand it uh, and then figure out um, what healthfulness looks like, what flourishing looks like, what abundance looks like. Um, I think that's what we're invited into and, and that's work that we get to do and we all can do it no matter where we are and no matter where we end up with our values. Yeah, that's a really beautiful statement. I love that. It's reminding me that I talked to a, um, a girl about pleasure mm -hmm. and her name is Isabella Frappier and she was just talking about, you know, the clitoris and how women are innately made for pleasure and that if mm -hmm. we can understand that, maybe we can get a better sense of what God believes we deserve, you know, and yeah. it's yeah. the same thing, obviously, you know, with male organs are also created with the potential for so much pleasure. Mm -hmm. But she was asking, you know, how often or many times are you masturbating in a way where you're not thinking about it, where you're just like trying to get it out of the way because you're ashamed of what you feel or you're doing it in some darkness because you don't want to face the, the music or you're turning on pornography so you don't have to think about what you're doing and engage with it. She was saying a good challenge would be to light a candle mm -hmm. and be intentional and, and sit, like you said, like, look at what you're doing. Now you're mm -hmm. here. You're going to do it anyway. You might as well be looking at it and assessing the truth. What have you been told that's true? What's a lie? Do you feel shame? What are we going to do with that? And I mean, I think an incredible recommendation would be to go by Beyond Shame <laughs> because, and I'm not even trying to, you know, do that as some sort of like final mm -hmm. promotion. I really mm -hmm. mean it authentically. Like I didn't get to dive in, but I did skim it. And everything you're saying about our body responses and the nuance and complication and the fact that it is a book that prompts you to think versus mm -hmm. telling you what to think. Right. All of that is so invaluable. And mm -hmm. it just seems like an incredible first step into mm -hmm. getting there. And mm -hmm. then you can pair with Tina's books, you yes. know, where all these crazy ideas came from in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean I, I mean, I love what you just said about pleasure. Like, I think that, that's so true. And, right. Yeah. And I mean, hopefully... I mean, my real hope for this book was was to give people a little bit of a roadmap um, yeah. that hopefully will prompt that for folks. The last thing I'd like to ask, um, you don't have to get too personal unless you want to, but Great. where are you now? What does mm. it look like on the other side? Yeah, you know, I, I, I honestly think that this is not like sexual health. In some ways we arrive at it, yes, like our sex can get, our sex, sexual lives can get healthier, but I think this journey of shame and sexuality is, is something that we're always on. Uh, mm -hmm. And so for me to sit here and be like, oh yeah, things and are And then great. he lived happily ever after. <laughs> that's not true. Like I, That's a perfect answer. The honest, the true answer is the right answer. Yeah. Shame is sneaky. Uh, and yeah. shame, I don't think shame ever, like, I don't think we ever conquer shame right mm. it's something we're always going to be working with in our lives uh, so the bigger question and this is like a continued question in my life is is when I do feel shame how do I work with it how do we work with it love uh, that. and that's a journey I'm still on I love um, that thank you for your humility and an honest answer mm, I love mm, that mm. it's always a good way to spot a real true teacher to me mm. You know, mm -hmm. if I meet someone that's not saying they have all the answers mm -hmm. when they're saying I'm in this with you. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, will you tell everyone where to find you on the internet and where to yes. buy the book? Yeah, absolutely. So you can buy, you can buy Beyond Shame uh, wherever you buy books. Uh, I, I think right now, you know, most online, people, yeah, <laughs> not online. In, your, in, in your house. Right. Um, a lot of local bookstores are actually shipping faster than, than the big stores right now. Love uh, that. So a, a really good place to buy it is, is bookshop.com. 
org that supports local bookstores oh, and you'll yay. get it faster than than the big online places so i'm i'm pointing people towards that oh good um, i need to move away from amazon so bad i know it's just so convenient like i can uh, get, get it <laughs> like evil corporations so scary yeah but, <laughs> but yes you can, buy it, you can buy it anywhere uh no no that website that sounds good yeah, yeah. and then uh I'm across the internet at Matthias Roberts and you can listen to my podcast, Queerology, wherever you, buy, wherever you get podcasts. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for listening or watching. Please like, subscribe, share with your friends, donate to my Patreon or Venmo if you can. We love, we you, love all. you all. God bless. God bless.